morning. I want to invite you to take your Bibles or your electronic devices or the Pew Bibles. It's, I will be reading from that translation uh, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 12 through 24. I want to share a word with the Lord with you today. I'm entitled Four Words That Can Change Any Situation. Four Words That Can Change Any Situation. Winston Churchill was invited to come back and speak at the uh, preparatory academy he attended, which coincidentally he did not do well at. It was even once reprimanded by his headmaster. Young man, if you don't straighten up, you will amount to little more than nothing. And now he's back as the great keynote speaker to graduation. And he gets up there. What is this great military, political leader, great hero of World War II going to say uh, after having a negative experience to begin with and now they love him? What's he going to say? He looks out at the young men and says, Young men, never, never, never give up. And sat down. Seven words. A very memorable speech. Uh, they say there's uh, certain things we need to say in certain situations that can help a lot of things out. A uh, way to keep three words, keep your marriage healthy and fresh and strong. Let's eat out. Let's look to God's word together. <laughs> Beginning with verse 12. Uh, the Apostle Paul is wrapping up this letter to the church at Thessalonica, and he says this. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in high regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that no one pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good in each other, what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. In this passage, there are some just, it's uh, kind of what the, and we, this is true of a lot of the letters of the New Testament. Some of them are done more eloquently than this one. But you see at the end of the letter, the writer was realizing he was running out of scroll space. And he had said really what he wanted to do, but there were a lot of little instructions. And they all get tacked on at the end. And so this is one of those places. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Do not be overcome by evil. Do not repay evil for evil, but good for evil. Do not quench the spirit. And there is this clever little sentence there in verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will in Christ Jesus. There are certain words that when they come to us, they create great joy. And excitement. We won. We got a raise. Things are looking better. It's all going to work out okay. You won't believe how 
What a break we got. Those words elevate our hearts, elevate our minds. We are excited when we hear them. But yes, there are just certain words in the English language, as in all languages, that cause fear and great worry. Cancer, death, bankruptcy, divorce, problems you didn't expect. Those are the kind of things you, at least I, I find myself thinking, God, let me go back to bed and let's just start this whole day over again. Let's, let's just... Let's just get a fresh start on this day. I don't know what is going to happen next, and I don't want to find out. God's got. So we have to uh, raise a, a serious question here as we understand this. And it's this question is, what is the, um, we must decide that where the evil in this world comes from. Does it come from God? Does it come from people? Does it come from the opportunities that God has allowed to happen? But does he directly bring those painful situations to your life or my life? That, that is the question that we have to work with. God is sovereign. He is completely sovereign. God is all-knowing. He knows all things that are occurring. That's uh, one of the for me, one of the profound mysteries about God is how he's able to know everything and then not just ruin him. Uh, there is so much wrong in our world. And sad to say, it's been that way for about us ever since they walked out of the garden. There's been so much wrong with this world. We, the people who God loves greatly, just do awful things to each other. All over the world, we know stories of stories. And sometimes the things we do are retribution for things that occurred centuries ago. It's hard to believe. How does God know all this? But does he cause all this? Or has he opened a door for us to be involved in this situation? Well, there's one affirmation I want to make for you today. If you don't take anything else out of this message is that everything good that comes to you is a gift of God. Everything good that comes to you in your life is a gift of God. A few years ago, I uh, was at the General Conference of the Methodist Church of 1988, and they, uh, Cokesbury was selling a lot of their old books, because I didn't know much about E. Stanley Jones, but he, was the, uh, he is still the patron saint of my alma mater, Asbury University. And so I thought I should buy some of his books, because... He's famous for I went to school. And he had just some good daily devotionals I bought. And at the bottom of every page, he had, this is your affirmation for today. And at the time, I thought, hmm, he needs an affirmation. I was um, invincible and 22 years old. I, I had it all together back then. It was a joke. Why didn't life's problems hit me when I knew everything? Yeah. Uh, but... He makes an affirmation on every day. And so I have, through the years, have become more and more aware how important it is to affirm what is good in your life. Make an affirmation every day. And so I want you to get this affirmation. That according to James 1.17, every good gift comes down from the Father. Who does not change? Like shifting shadows, every good gift. If there's anything in your life you think, that was great. Wow, I like that. Say, thank you, Lord. Because it's his gift to you. He is very into the giving of good gifts. Evil, pain, difficulty, loss of people. Where does this come from? It was a strange experience for me to go back to a church I preached at, I served several years ago, and preach homecoming. And their homecomings are great. Everybody's so happy to see you. You, uh, by being away from a church for a number of years, you become a better preacher. <laughs> At least in their minds, they, they seem like I always have become a better preacher. It's just great. Everybody's so happy to see me. It feels good. And seeing people, and uh, I saw this lady, and her son was with him, and he was a little boy when I was there, and now he's a teenager, 17 years old, big football player kind of looking guy. We talked. It was good. Met him. 
And the week that followed, he died in a four-wheeler accident. Uh, it was really weird to see him on a Sunday and hear on Thursday that he was gone. Uh, it was tragic anyway, but it was really tragic because I hadn't seen him in years. Then I see him, and then all of a sudden this happens. It's one of those weird things. So I went back over, and I uh, was very close to the grandmother. There's one of these families, extended families in Dell County, and the people over there are very connected to the land. All the extended family lives in about 100 acres of each other. And I was very close to the grandmother, the matriarch of the family. And I spent some time with her and visited. And I went to uh, the mother's office and spent some time with her. And we talked and we talked and she talked and she talked and I listened. And I had to say this to her. Did God cause this? Did God cause this? Do you think God caused this accident where your son was killed this week? Uh, a few weeks ago. It was several weeks later before I could uh, work my way back over there and find a time and a schedule to do that. And I, she said, I don't know. Because she had actually said that in the conversation that she did think God had caused her son to die. Had taken her son from her. And I was like, okay. Do you really think that? And she said, you know, I don't really know. I said, well... I can't force you to think one way or another, but it's good. You're going to need to work through that question. What causes evil in our world? But maybe that's just too academic. So let's think about what, what to think about when we are in those situations. First of all, we have to realize that God can be at work in every situation. Now, the verse that follows says God is at work, and I put the word can. This is not an accident. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So why would I say can if, if the sentence after it says is? Am I trying to outsmart God? No, I'm not. What I'm trying to put forth before you is that God is at work in our tough situations, but a lot of times we get so focused on what we dislike about them, we don't see that. And so that's why I use the word can. The can is for us to raise our awareness, to understand that, to take it in that. In any situation, he says, any situation, God works for the good of those who love him. A lot of times, what are we thinking when we're in a tough situation? Beam me up, Scotty. Beam me up. Get me out of here. That, that's off of a TV show from the 1960s, for those of you who did, or, or not that generation. Uh, but, you know, get me out of here. That's all God's saying. I'm working in it. Do you see the difference there? And that brings us a greater dependence on God. And then secondly, do we believe that God can bend a situation for your good or for the good of others? He didn't cause it, but he can take it and bring about good. Now, I've said this in sermons, and I've got some of the worst looks when I say this in sermons. I sometimes get afraid of that because I, I get just the meanest, angriest looks. That you're you saying that God can bring a good out of that situation. Yeah, I am. Am I flippant? Am I uncaring? No, I'm very caring. And I've struggled myself to see that in some of my situations. God, you're supposed to make this work for good, but I'm not seeing it right now, Lord. I'm not seeing it. There's this great story of the story of Joseph. Uh, you know it. He's the uh, youngest child in the family at the time. From multiple wives. And the multiple wives cause multiple loyalty conflicts. And he's the one they dislike. They want to, if you read the story carefully, they want to kill him. They sell him into slavery because they think they could get rid of him and make money. Even though they threw him in a well, uh, a cistern it's called, and we're just going to let him starve to death. Let the buzzards find him eventually. Just, I mean, that, that, that's really disliking somebody. But they sell him and he goes into slavery. You know the story. He passes through very somewhat different owners. He winds up uh, in prison, goes to 
the Pharaoh, and becomes basically the prime minister of the civilized world. And he's able to provide grain for everybody, including the people of Israel, that would be his family, when they come to him. And he treats them good, and things are good. They're living in the land of Goshen, a part of Egypt. But it's a real funny thing, if you ever, haven't ever paid close attention to Genesis 50. It's, it's, it's kind of a funny little story. Because the father, their father dies. Jacob dies. And the brothers, it starts to like dawn on them. Hmm. What we did to our brother was really bad. And he's the most powerful man, second most powerful man in our world. And if he wants us killed, and our children, and our, our, even our slaves and our animals, all he has to do is say the word and it will be done. So they, 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 they organize kind of a political party and they have a talk with him and they say, hey, Joseph, I know dad forgot to tell you, but uh, he told us, but he probably forgot to tell you, don't kill us, please. Read the story, really, is what is happening. I'm paraphrasing and shortening the story, but that's what that was. You know, if you don't mind, please don't kill us. Dad said, don't kill us. Because what we did was really creepy. And Genesis says, uh, Joseph says, yes, you intended to harm me. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done for the saving of many lives. You, he, this is not denial saying, oh, well, it's okay. You really didn't do anything wrong. No, no, he, he, he confronts them. Yeah, you intended to harm me. It was mean. But God is greater than your meanness. And he was able to bend it into something really, really good. I wanted to do a children's sermon today, but couldn't get my brain around it this week enough. Of, of finding something that looked like one thing, but bend it into something else. If y'all got any great ideas, that might come up again. But, but God has the ability to bend a situation. I like what it says in the CEV, the Contemporary English Version. You tried to harm me, but God made, turn it out, made it turn out for the best so that he could save all these people as he is now doing. God is able to bend and change things for the good of those in the situation. So four words that recognize the greatness of God over every situation you face. And everything, give thanks. New King James. Or contemporary English versions. Whatever happens, give, keep giving thanks. What happens when we do this? Well, first of all, you are affirming that God is in your situation. You are recognizing that you're not lost. You're not alone. You're not cut off. God has poured good into your situation. Also, and this to me, this is the biggest detail for me as I've experienced it. You broaden your focus. The most important thing to do when you're facing a tough situation is Focus your mind on what is positive. You're going to notice what's negative. You're going to see what's painful. The problems are there. They're flashing neon. <laughs> notice, notice, notice. The mature Christian goes a step further and begins to focus on what is good. What could be good in a bad situation? Number one, your relationships. If you've got the right people with you in a lot of situations, that is so vital to you doing well. Number two, you have a gift of hope from God that keeps you going. It can keep you going day in and day out. You can, um, I'm working on a sermon on the, on the truth of hope in our lives that it's, it's a noun and a verb, and it used one way, it can mean <laughs> hopelessness. In another sense, it can mean confidence. Affirm that God has given you confidence. And I'll say a little bit more about what is positive here at the end of the sermon. don't want to get ahead of myself. But I want to say to you, the, that is what we have before us. 
Yes, but how? How can we do it? YBH. All those great platitudes you can say. This is what you ought to do, but how do you turn it in to a reality? Um, it would be kind of fun to go around the room and pass out three by five cards and uh, let, let all of us answer this question. How, how do you uh, give thanks, keep giving thanks in the midst of a tough situation? You know, and I, I, we could read them out and hear what everybody said. You know what would even be more fun is like read them out and if you can guess who said it, you get a Snickers bar. Wouldn't that be really cool? Because uh, I've been in a, um, uh, some of these Q&A things with pastors where we turn in anonymous questions and you figure out who wrote them. I just think that's just be a lot of fun to do. But really good to do. But real quickly, how do you do it? First of all, I just said it. Affirm what's positive. Look for the positive. Find the positive. Affirm the positive. Notice it and give thanks to God for it. Number two, this sounds counterintuitive. Give to others. When you feel you are going through a difficult time, stay with me on this. This is really, really crucial. When you're going through a difficult time, you have a strong tendency. And someone, the person who taught me this was someone who worked with, 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 with very beaten down people. And when he first said this to me, it actually offended me. Like, you, you're kind of mean. But as I've thought about it in my own life, I found it to be true. That when you're going through a difficult situation, you can become the most selfish. Because when you're going through a difficult situation, who do you notice? Yourself. You, you, you get all about yourself. You, uh, so find ways to give to others. Open your heart up when you're going through that tough situation. It's going to make you stronger. It's going to give you better perspective. And then finally, stay in the situation. Uh, we have... Um, I, it seemed like every week I see an article about the opioid crisis in America today. Well, what are we trying to do? Check out on life. Check out on life. Just, just remove myself from the situation. And God says, stay in the situation. He's got more resources for you than you realize. What happens? What changes when you give thanks? You change. That's what changes. Uh, that's been the most amazing thing for me as a pastor when I've walked with people through some tough situations that I've observed that the situation sometimes never really got any better. But the person changed. And so the situation didn't drown the person. So giving thanks changes you. It moves you to an attitude of faith it takes you from an attitude of fear and worry. Uh, it's one of those questions, I guess I'll never know the answer. Who, who teaches us how to worry and be afraid? Who, who teaches us that? Where do we learn that? I, I don't know. But that's what changes is you. Okay, what do you, what, why do you have to give thanks in all situations? Three simple reasons. If you're following there on, on, on the back of the bull, then you, I invite you to look at this. There's this uh, beautiful psalm. When I uh, see, it, and it's not on the slide, I believe it's Psalm 34, 8. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of them, and the son of man that you care for him? Look at the stars. Look at the moon. Uh, who was that? Oh, that was last Sunday. Somebody, somebody was talking to me about galaxies yeah, last Sunday. That we're in a galaxy, but there's a whole bunch more of them. It's, it's, it's amazing what is all is out there. And even though astronomy had not been invented when this was written, the person writing it had a perspective of how big everything is. It says, what is man that you are mindful of him? That you know about us, that you care about us, that you help us. Who are we to expect this? But God says, yes, you should expect it because I've got to deliver it. So first of all, you have to affirm that God is present with you. 
that God is right there in that situation with you. This is really hard. This is really difficult. Yes, but the Lord is with us. In the days of John Wesley, uh, they could pretty much predict uh, the death of a person. So it was, it's really strange to say this. It was common to give a speech right before you died. They had a number of uh, death rituals in 1700s in the in English culture, because I'm interested in John Wesley, I've noticed them. They also would make a plaster cast of your face and save it. Uh, death masks, they called them. I've even seen the death mask of John Wesley, and I don't know why they did that. <laughs> I don't know. But they, they did that. So Wesley knew his hours were few, and he knew he should say something. And he said this sentence, best of all, God is with us. The world had begun to shift in the thinking at that time that God was not part of the world, that he had checked out on us, called deism. Christianity punches it right in the face and says, no, for the follower of Jesus Christ, God is present with us. He is with us. So you have to first affirm who you've got with you. Number two, affirm that God knows what is happening. Yes, the Lord knows everything going on in your situation. It's hard. It's difficult. But God does not sleep like we do. God doesn't wake up angry and get on the wrong side of things. And I've had people sometimes tell me, uh, I've asked them, have you talked to the Lord about this? And they go, no, because I'm mad at God. And I have to seriously ask this question, not facetiously in a sarcastic way, but a very serious way. Do you think he, do, do, do you understand he knows that? He, he, he understands your anger. There have been times, and I don't want to say I'm God, but this is kind of a little bit of a parallel. In a relationship with my children, sometimes they would be angry at me or me and Elise due to decisions we made. And it was perfectly okay. Matter of fact, I expected it didn't change my love for them at all. It didn't ruin my day or my ego. It hurt that they were sad, really hurt that they were sad. But beyond that, it was perfect. It did nothing to change our relationship, uh, at least my relationship to them. And I think when we are angry at God, you have to realize he knows what's happening and you have to be willing to share that with him. It's been my experience that people who won't share that, they have a harder time getting over it. But when we will bring our every grief to bear to the Lord, it, 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 it helps you be able to heal and depend on Him. And then finally, you have to affirm that God is at work in this situation. The Lord is working in your situation. He's making a difference. He's involved with that. He is at work. Now, there have been times I have had trouble seeing this. But this situation seemed really stuck. <laughs> really stuck. I didn't like the direction the train was heading. But it didn't mean God wasn't at work at the situation. Maybe he, and there were times I figured he saw that things needed to take place so we would deal with things. That I didn't want to deal with, at least. I shouldn't say we. I didn't want to deal with. And then other times that God is wanting to um, just teach us things and allow us to grow to match the situation. We've got to keep ourselves on the right plane. There's a story of an airplane pilot of the desert variety of the 1940s flying his plane. And, you know, those Casablanca-looking landing strips they used to have. And he's, he's flying. The pilot hears a noise inside what you would call the dash of the airplane, rustling of wires. And he knows from his experience that there's a rat <laughs> inside there gnawing on the wires. So the gauges and the controls of this airplane may become quickly compromised 
and uh, he may have difficulty uh, flying the plane uh, due to the uh, rat having lunch. But, uh, you know, it's mice, rats, they go places we can't go. Ain't no way he can go in there and get it out. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't stick my hand in there, I'll tell you that. So what's the pilot do? So he took it into a, 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 a steep, steep climb. And he kept going higher and higher and higher and higher. Till the rustling of the wires went silent. The thinness of the air killed the rat. There are things in our lives we have to keep ourselves on a plane so those other things won't influence us and we miss the hand of God in our lives. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, help us to uh, receive from you all that you have for us. Lord, help us to have the courage to use those four powerful words and everything give thanks. Help us be able to depend on you and receive your goodness in our lives so that we may grow in the fullness of maturity that you have for each of us. It's hard to think sometimes, but you're more concerned about our holiness and our happiness. You're more concerned about what goes on inside of us than what goes on to us. Lord, help us to depend on you and give you thanks no matter what the circumstances are. In Christ's name we pray, amen.